thank you uh, everyone for joining us today. I think before I kick start this session, I do have uh, two notable mentions. One is uh, Michael, thank you so much for joining us. As we all know, the focus of the session is on global structures from tax and IP perspective, and we're very glad you accepted our invitation. I'm very sure our attendees will uh, benefit from your learnings, your experience, and uh, your, the content that you have to share with us today. And um, my second notable mention is to Gauri. Uh, if you can see her on screen, actually most people who have been attending our webinars would have seen her on screen often, but Gauri actually did all three webinars uh, that we hosted today on a variety of topics from gaming to pharma and now IP tax. But I must give it to you, Gauri, being a true media uh, lawyer, you did a three, six and 9 p.m. session. So hats off to you on that one. <laughs> Um, quickly moving to the to the session flow today, I'm going to present. I'm going to be a moderator for the day, and I'm going to present Gauri, Michael, and Rajesh with about five to six structures. These are complex cross-border structures, and we're going to focus uh, on IP and tax issues um, uh, while we discuss each of these structures. I would request the audience to please pay close attention, discussing cross or learning about cross-border structures, especially when we have complex IP and tax issues uh, involved is not very easy, but if you have questions, please do post it in the chat window. We will keep moving from one model to another. We'll go from you know an easy one to a more complex one as we progress. So we will be happy to take questions as and when you know you 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 post them on the window. So let me kick start with the first structure now. My first structure is something that we know as the flip model. Uh, this is for all three of you. Uh, many Indian startups, you know, are uh, now focused on content creation. Content could be in the nature of software development. It could be, you know, any other sort of content. Also, there is pharma content, there is R&D, there is also media content. Now, as these companies grow, uh, they realize that, you know, there is a market uh, for them beyond India as well. And at that point in time, they look at externalization. They look at, you know, uh, foreign jurisdictions for, for the purpose of housing their IP. So, Gauri, my questions to you from, you know, to start this discussion is that should or can the Indian company actually move out its IP from the Indian company to a foreign company? If yes, how does the Indian company gets access to this IP? Because, you know, now the IP has moved to a foreign company, but it still requires access to this IP for further development purposes. And how do the, how does the Indian and the foreign company protect, uh, you know, this IP in different jurisdictions? Sure, Arushi. Now, there are multiple layer, layers in your question, so I'm going to just try to deal with them, you know, step by step. And this will help even in our other discussions, you know, when we go to the more complex structures. So, as you can imagine that when an Indian company is sort of generating IP, whether in the nature of, you know, sort of patentable inventions, copyrighted material, design, uh, you know, uh, even integrated circuits, whatever it may be, we have seen structures in all these areas, one way or the other. So what typically happens is when the startup comes to a certain maturity in terms of development, that is the time they feel that, you know, there is a global market, as you rightly said, and then they transfer the IP. The question arises is whether they transfer the complete worldwide right outside India, or there is a model where you will transfer only the out uh, uh, non-Indian rights outside India, these are, you know, usually the decision-making points, right? And if you need to continue to exploit that IP in India as the, as uh, not merely as a service provider, but as the owner, as an, as an Indian entity, sometimes from a, you know, overall, whether it is, whether tax efficiency or otherwise, that's something I'm sure, you know, Michael and Rajesh will deal with, but often we find that you want to keep the Indian uh, piece of the IP within India. And here the clear understanding of the IP becomes very important because IP is ultimately a territorial right, correct? So therefore, uh, when I say if I have an Indian patent, for example, there is no way if I don't have a patent outside India, in outside India, there is to my mind zero value, right? So what I'm simply transferring outside India is the know-how uh, of that particular or technology behind that which in other countries may have zero value. So clear understanding with the, with the absence of a registered patent in other jurisdictions, 
we have often seen that you know especially in the startup scheme of things or whatever they assign a particular value outside india there may not be real value to that because of the absence of patent when it comes to copyright of course uh, you know copyright because of the bern convention you automatically have it most jurisdiction so when it comes to software because in most jurisdiction is protected as copyright that issue doesn't really arise when it comes to uh, you know and in indian context you will find that often uh, you know that the startups are in the software sector so there there is automatic you know protection in the other countries and therefore obviously the question of valuation etc may not come up when it comes to trademark similar to the the patent issue which i said that you may have a trademark in india registered used and all of that and there is zero value outside india today because it has not been used outside india so the question arises in this situation when i'm saying that okay i'm you know lock stock barrel i'm transferring the business outside india what or what how do i package each of these because on trademark there isn't a value that can be ascribed outside india so do i transfer the trademark or i say that okay let the indian trademark be controlled in india by the indian entity and in the foreign jurisdiction since it is going to be foreign exploitation let that foreign entity as and when it is set up let that entity go and apply for trademarks and start using trademark outside india without any uh, you know relationship with the indian entity when it comes to trademark transfer because technically there is no right in that jurisdiction so you can't you know going back to the basics of the you know of the law that you cannot transfer you know better title than you have indian company really doesn't have that ip outside india what does it transfer but often we find that these nuances are not understood and then certain valuation etc exercise may be done without you know going back to the base creating probably some tax exposure or otherwise unnecessarily you know paying certain tax etc so these nuances are important the other thing uh, you know uh, uh, the point that you mentioned let me just quickly deal with that and, and then i'll stop that often we find that when you are externalizing ip right when you are shifting the base remains india when it comes to the development of ip further development so what you are transferring outside india is more of exploitation right and then you need a right transfer back not for exploitation so suppose you decide that the foreign entity is going to control the ip for the entire world in india then what you are really doing and i think michael was alluding to that before that when you are really doing is transferring back the license not for exploitation and this is something which is important to be understood which i'll request rajesh and you know michael to address is that i'm not transferring back the license for exploitation by indian entity as the you know for the commercialization i'm transferring back the license for further development for you know the 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 foreign entity now which which is owning the ip so some of these things i thought i'll bring to the table so that these will be repeated questions probably you know for the other structures so you know i'll stop here and see you know for whatever points i have covered how 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 does uh, you know how does rajesh and michael look at it uh, you know for each of the elements and rajesh maybe you can come in here because i think gauri did my job easy by asking you the question but she said that you know there's a license back for a limited purpose of not commercial exploitation but possibly further development how does this situation uh, also uh, turn on a tax perspective and these are because these are two related entities uh, that we are talking about they're group entities so as to say so so i think what the distinction that we need to make here is that it is not a case where the license back to the indian entity is for the purposes of exploitation by the indian company rather it is to help the indian company do further development for the benefit of the foreign company so i think that's the way i would generally look at it rather than trying to say that oh you know what they should be treated as a license and there should be a, a, a arms length payment and there should be a withholding tax uh, on the transaction but i would rather look at the transaction as one where i'm saying that i am giving you um, uh, the the rights to my product so that you can undertake further development as per my requirements and for that purpose alone i'm giving you the license and not for the purposes of exploitation so i think that's the important distinction that you tend to uh, or you need to make uh obviously the indian entity is going to be taxed in respect of its income which you do it on a arms length basis but you will not 
necessarily charge a separate amount for the license from the foreign entity to the Indian entity. So I think that's the part which I would sort of bring about on the relicense part. Yeah, and Rajesh, <laughs> situation we are licensing it for development, but possibly there is an additional right given for further distribution in India. I'm just adding a little bit complexity since we are dealing with this model. So, so again, uh, and I'll. So it is very important in that case, and I'll come back to to one of. Uh, a, a controversial judgment in some time, but it's very important that there, there are two different rights that we are talking about. One is the uh, one is really where the Indian entity has taken on the additional development activities. The second is a separate distribution related activity. So in, in respect of the distribution related activity, obviously you have to see then whether uh, the right which is provided uh, there will be a withholding tax implication, whether it can be treated as a uh, uh, royalty or uh, uh, FTS, depending on the nature of rights. Let's say if it's uh, product uh, related activities, generally you meet the FTS test. Um, so, so there may be a withholding tax complication, uh, but you should also go back to at least some precedents like we've had the Google case um, where the Bangalore tribunal had sort of um, combined or uh, sort of mixed up two different issues. Uh, one in respect of uh, where an Indian entity was actually sourcing uh, uh, advertisements for the benefit of the foreign entity. So they were going in under a premise that uh, that uh, we don't really, uh, all none of this should qualify as a PE, but they were also doing development related activities. And what you actually had was the tribunal sort of meshing up all the different activities and saying that you know what it is actually one combined activity which we are going to look at as uh, and said that yes there should be a withholding tax but that's something that you always need to be careful about that when you have multiple different streams of arrangements um, uh, the, the risk that is there is properly segregated or will uh, uh, the tax authorities say that i'm going to combine everything and sort of then recharacterize the whole transaction Great, great. So, up to you. Is the flip structure uh, recognized in in, uh, in the U.S.? How does U.S. law uh, treat such a structure? This is clearly possible in India, and many Indian startups look at doing it. But what happens from a U.S. perspective? Yeah, thank you for that, um, Arushi, and and thank you to to the entire Nishista side team. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, the so I. I loved how you introduced this as the simplest of the structures from a from a U.S. perspective. This would actually be one of the most complex structures uh, because if it, for instance, this was a U.S. and not an Indian company trying to flip the IP, um, we would have, first of all, a number of tax uh, recognition rules that would come into play. In fact, the U.S. has uh, over the past, I'll call it 10 years, taken a lot of steps to combat these types of structures. U.S. companies tried to, um, uh, you know, in the early 2000s up until about 2000, I'd say 14, 15, U.S. companies tried to do uh, something similar to what Gary was talking about earlier in terms of separating the uh, non-U.S. Uh, IP rights from the U.S. IP rights from a beneficial ownership standpoint, move the non-U.S. rights off offshore and not have them taxed in the U.S. Well, a number of rules have come into play. We have um, rules that would recognize gain on the outbound transfer of that um, intellectual property. We have rules that would require uh, deemed royalties back to the U.S. government, uh, to the U excuse me, the U.S. entity for those. Um, and now we have, and now you would be, in, <laughs> as we say jokingly, you would be guilty in the U.S. So we have a global intangible low tax income um, concept that would tax uh, what we would deem is to be intangible income earned by these uh, foreign affiliates. So I think um, this type of a structure, if one was going to do it from a U.S. perspective, would definitely need to be careful about how one does it um, to avoid tripping up some of these rules. Or if you do, you're working on low valuations uh, when you do trip them. Uh, Amazon, uh, I think everybody's familiar with Amazon.com, got into a little fist fight with the Internal Revenue Service on situations like this and actually was able to win, showing that the, that the value of the intellectual property they transferred was low and had a very short, useful life. And so we're able to uh, sort of restrict the, 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 the impact of it. Um, 
if we switch back to this being an Indian company, one thing I would comment on from a U.S. tax perspective is, first of all, um, you would not, I would be, if the Indian company was my client, I was advising on U.S. tax, Rajesh probably knows this issue very well. I would be very wary about mo about having this foreign company be a U.S. company. If it was a U.S. company, I would want to make sure that where everybody is very clear about what type of rights are being transferred to this U.S. company and what the tax implications of those would be, because transferring a once you once you transfer stuff into the U.S., it gets very hard to get it back out again. Um, so I would just comment that that would be the big comment I would have. And the second one is not really a tax comment. It's more of a um, an IP comment. But typically what you, we see when we uh, set up development agreements with um, either foreign affiliates or third parties is whether that third party is within the U.S. or outside is we don't actually have a license of the intellectual property to the to that uh, third party or that foreign affiliate. It's a strictly a services arrangement. And we typically are very clear as to who retains ownership of the intellectual property. So maybe you could conceive it as a bare license to use the property, but really we're not, we're only, they only get to use the property insofar as they're performing services for um, our affiliate um, or, or the, the actual owner of the property. Um, so those would be my main comments on, on this structure. Thank you so much, Michael. And I think one underlying point that we would like to, you know, highlight to the user, to our listeners, which you just mentioned, something which we thought was simple in India is probably a, a very complex structure in US. This is the beauty of global structures. You need to think where you do business very carefully and, and need to know about local laws because you don't know how you're treated under local laws. So with that, I'm going to move to my second structure. My second structure is basically more like a content development or a software development structure. Now, uh, we have, uh, we all know that, you know, India is known for a services industry. It's known for, uh, you know, a, a lot of software development work. There are many occasions when foreign companies engage Indian companies for uh, development work purposes. So, Gauri, my question to you is that, you know, how do concepts of ownership and uh, assignment and vesting of rights Therefore, when we look at, say, from a U.S. jurisdiction purpose and, and an Indian IP law perspective. Sure. So, as Michael will be, you know, quite familiar with the, with the, in terms of the concept of for hire, right? Basically, that when the U.S. entity is appointing an Indian entity in more of commissioned work or a work for hire uh, model, can you hear me now? I think you were not able to hear me well. Okay. Yes, we can. Yeah. We have that kind of a structure. It is often forgotten that under Copyright Act, because now I'm going to deal with two specific IPs. One is the software, as you mentioned, and the other one, we, we have begun to see a lot of US corporations now, you know, sort of uh, uh, all the platforms, even the uh, even the studios are generating a lot of media, you know, uh, content in India, right? And therefore, we do have cross-border agreements which are in the works for hire, where the Indian entity is essentially acting as a line producer to the foreign entity. Now, the difference that needs to be brought out here from an Indian law perspective, when it comes to software, technically under Indian law, a work for hire concept doesn't apply to the software means that even if it's a commissioned relationship, the, the foreign entity will not be treated as the first owner of the work. Right? Therefore, you will need to properly transfer or assign to the foreign entity. Now, when the agreement is governed by US law, in most cases, you know, that we will see this, the question really arises is, will the this particular element as to on what basis is the transfer happening or the vesting happening in the u.s entity is governed by the u.s law or is it governed by the indian law because what will be the rules of private international law in that situation right typically what you will find is that you will have for hire but as a back you will find that there will be a clause with where there is an assignment now, these two are different concepts 
together because in the first situation the foreign entity is the first owner so what they they are really paying indian entity is for the services rendered in the second situation when you have to transfer the rights the indian entity is the first owner and then what it is receiving is really not a service fee but an assignment fee if you really look at it from a pure you know copyright law perspective so that is where the issues arise and uh, you know we have seen probably in one of the judgments which was in the context of uh, uh, of content creation luckily i think one of the tax rulings they looked into section 17 and recognized that yes you know as to who is the first owner of the ip and then they said okay that is more of a services relationship but the software doesn't necessarily get into i think uh, and we don't really i mean i have tried this from a private international law perspective there is no clarity out there to my mind uh, you know on on this uh, you know this kind of a scenario and then how you know how how the impact will be in terms of how do you characterize the indian company's income whether a service fee or a is something of, i mean currently of course everybody is going by the service fee model but that is one issue which which keeps bothering me in the in the software for the software purpose so uh, rajesh and michael why don't you help uh, solving gauri's confusion uh, maybe you can give her an answer which will uh, put this question to rest so sure. let me try and take a stab at it i i think gauri the way i would always view it is that irrespective of whether you look at it as a service uh, fee or a fee towards assignment i would still classify both as business profits for the indian entity because from a indian entity standpoint ultimately for it this is part and parcel of its business uh, so so i would generally characterize this as part of the business income for the company irrespective of whether you want to treat it as a as a assignment or whether you want to treat it as a service fee i think where i start worrying about a lot more um, uh, especially nowadays is from a transfer pricing standpoint and some of the work that's been done on webs where increasingly um, uh, the the trend is towards saying that okay i will see who's the uh, i'm going to separate legal ownership and uh, economic uh, ownership uh so so the question that really comes up is that is it going to start bumping up the the margins which the indian entity has to be compensated um, with as it is i think uh, tra transfer pricing in india and these models are uh, yeah, pretty litigious so it, so that's one aspect which i would tend to point and how does michael thank you um i think one uh, I, I would second what um, Rajesh said about the transfer pricing and the um, and the, the the potential for increasing margins. I will add that I will comment that from a U.S. perspective or U.S. Indian perspective, um, and, and Rajesh may have some knowledge about this as well. The U.S. and the and the Indian governments about I think it was about four or five years ago, maybe less actually, um, uh, they um, brought in the they uh, started or restarted the bilateral um, uh, agreement procedure whereby uh, Indian uh, U.S. companies and Indian companies that were affiliated could enter into a, a, a under the treaty do a enter into an agreement for uh, determining the transfer pricing that both countries would accept. Um, Rajesh, has that been your experience? Have you worked on some of those? Uh, so, so I think um, uh, you're right. As in the Especially between India and US, the map proceedings, at least uh, till uh, till uh, a few years back, was not really successful. Uh, the important element um, uh, uh, in the India-US treaty is that while the map proceedings are underway, you don't have to uh, actually pay the tax, but you can furnish a bank guarantee. So that was one reason why people liked the map proceeding under under the India-US treaty. But uh, obviously, uh, there was not enough progress being made on that to be. Uh, at the at the government level but you're right as in in the last few years uh, india has been extensively looking at uh, trying to uh, close out um, uh, yeah, well, uh, to uh, map proceedings so that's something which even we yeah and the other thing i would add on 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 this structure that we, we we're looking at this uh, software content development structure 
um, is for, from my perspective, it would be very important to uh, from a U.S. perspective, if it was a U.S. Uh, parent that is um, entering into this agreement with the Indian subsidiary, it'd be very important given our control foreign corporation rules to know whether this is services income being performed in India versus um, uh, uh, royalty income that is being earned in India. Because if you're dealing with royalty income um, and it's not what we consider active royalty income, in this case, it could, it could very well be active, but it's not, nevertheless gives a, I, I much prefer services income performed in country to royalty income because um, it gets me out of something called subpart F income for the U.S. perspective. The other issue is depending on what type of tangible property the Indian subsidiary is using, again, it's going to be guilty in that it could potentially raise this global and tangible low tax income for the U.S. parent um, based on the services performed in India and earned in India. That being said, there is a proposed exception out there that the U.S. government has been bandying about um, for quote unquote high tax jurisdictions. I think India's tax rate, correct me if I'm wrong, Rajesh, is about 30 percent. That's that's right. I think the headline tax rate is around 30 percent. So you might actually under this under this proposed regulation, if it ever gets finalized for a U.S. for a U.S. parent, um, they would have a any U.S. parent that's doing business in India would have a, a get out of jail free card for what would otherwise be, quote unquote, guilty income there. Um, yeah, I think, go, go ahead. Go, go ahead, Michael. Sorry, finish your thought. Uh, the, the last thing I was going to say is I would often, if there was, was a, U, a, a U.S. parent and an Indian sub, I'd often consider it what we call a check the box election to disregard the Indian sub, because then I, have, I, I get away from a lot of these complex rules and I just, I, I bring all the, all the, I, I don't have to worry about the income from a U.S. perspective and I potentially can get the foreign tax credits as well. Go ahead. Rajesh. Yeah, I think I think just on that point, right? Because I was actually uh, going to ask you on the check the box election, because that's something which we are seeing increasingly U.S. corporations wanting to do uh, when they have Indian uh, captives, just as you alluded to, in order to get out of some of the other challenges which are there. And that's sort of also because earlier there was a much bigger issue which was there because in terms of repatriation of profits from India, because we had the concept of dividend distribution tax as compared to dividend withholding tax, which was additional corporate tax. But now uh, I think with going back to the classical dividend withholding tax concept in India, uh, it actually makes sense check the box, you can repatriate the cash, move it back into the US. So that sort of um, uh, has been an approach which we are actually seeing quite a few people uh, or US corporations look at actively undertaking. Sorry, Arushik, uh, back to you. <laughs> no problem. And, and, uh, thank you so much, both of you. Gauri, I have an Indian and a US tax expert answer your question. So that's brownie points for me. I, I hope your confusion stands resolved now. <laughs> Let me, uh, with that, I'm going to move on to the to the next structure. I like to call it is is there a license structure? So let me play this out for you uh, all for, for for all three of you. So let's take a scenario where we have, for example, a global IP holding company, U.S. company to be more specific. They have worldwide. They have applied for trademarks in many different jurisdictions of the world. But for some reason, they decided, or maybe by sheer ignorance, the Indian affiliate entity ended up applying for trademark registration in India. It's basically for the same mark. So a couple of things that, you know, I'm putting two variations to it. One, where it's basically just the Indian entity which has applied for a trademark in India, whereas for the rest of the world, the trademark is, based, uh, is vesting with the U.S. entity. A second variation to it is, for example, the U.S. entity did apply for some mark in India in the name of the U.S. entity, maybe, you know, a word mark. But the Indian entity uh, applied for a logo mark, which kind of incorporates the word mark. So my questions to you, Gauri, are how, how does Indian trademark law, I mean, I was about to say tax law, I think I heard too much tax here, but how does Indian trademark law look at this situation? And, you know, is there a license uh, implied in this case? Sure, Arushi. You know, this is something which we see quite often. You have a, uh, you know, especially the structure that we spoke earlier when you have a 
uh, uh, work. It could be simply a captive for the development work. It could be an end which is actually doing its own business. When I say own business, a commercial business, right? So I would look at you know these situations slightly differently, and I'll tell you why. So suppose you have a U.S. entity with a with a with a corporate name as X Y Z. and it has a captive in 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 india doing work only for the us entity right it doesn't have an independent business in india and this indian entity is also basically using the uh, you know the name of the company as xyz because of it is a it is a you know independent uh, entity but it also is a part of the so it will just say xyz private limited in you know india private limited that's a standard that you will see often you don't necessarily earlier day we would not necessarily see a license agreement in this construct because they are not indian the monetizing that xyz within india it is simply acting as a captive for the us entity right so this is one scenario whether there is a implied trademark license agreement there may or may not be so we will come to that the second situation uh, uh, is uh, sorry one more aspect is sometimes when you uh, when you go for the company registration we have often seen that if they find that you know there is there are other entities with the same name or a foreign entity they may sometimes ask for a noc which is a no objection certificate from a foreign entity for incorporating that xyz in the indian company's name right so this is one situation where in my mind the indian entity is is it the question is is the indian entity using the trademark xyz as a trademark in india because if you really see the definition of trademark it is the use of the word or or, or the mark in relation to carrying out of you know certain go, you know activity which is the goods and services here in the indian context that trademark is not being used for the purpose of carrying that for you know the commercial activity within india now let's take a separate scenario where you have a foreign entity xyz indian entity is an entity which is actually going to carry out commercial business the model that probably michael mentioned you know pr prior to the session is you know it is buying the goods from the foreign entity selling you know or whatever i'm not getting into retail trading activity but you know you know but basically some commercial activity within india having its own customers etc and then the foreign entity uh, you know sort of allowing the indian entity to use the trademark now it is the indian entity really deriving the value of that foreign entity's trademark in india because it is carrying out an independent business and an independent commercial activity using the benefit of that trademark in india so i will distinguish these two you know scenarios somewhat differently and then we need to see the the impact but in either case if there is no trademark license then what happens now as i was saying before ultimately trademark is a territorial right so nothing stops an indian company to you know go and apply for that trademark the question is really is that should there was there, suppose there was a situation when there is a completely different entity in india trying to use the same trademark for a commercial activity in india the foreign entity allowed that to happen only they don't have a current business in india and the answer probably is no they may still go after the indian entity claiming that no i do have a cross border reputation in india you will not you know apply you know use that trade but only because if it is a related party they are not taking that action and allowing that entity to use the trademark so in that context do we see do we say that there is an implied license if even if there is no you know actual license agreement in place right from an ip perspective i don't see that as an issue because as i said it's a territorial right correct but i will distinguish the two scenarios specifically one with the, with captive no independent commercial activity second independent commercial activity okay got it and uh, uh, rajesh and michael i would like you to come in uh, please let's be also cognizant of the fact that we are already uh, 40 minutes into the session so if we can be slightly brief we still have about three more structures to cover i i think i'll be pretty brief around this i think the, the what i worry about again here is transfer pricing uh, whether a separate consideration ought to be charged uh, for the trademark uh, i agree with gauri when she talks about the two different scenarios when you are a captive just doing services for the head office versus uh, doing a, a, a b2c business for example 
uh, with other clients. So I would tend to think that yes, in the in the B2C model, I will generally uh, need a charge for uh, for uh, transport pricing purposes. Uh, obviously, there are arguments which are there to say that even if the Indian entity does not uh, uh, charge anything, uh, there is no base erosion and therefore uh, no transfer pricing adjustment that is required. So the, while that is there, but I would tend to think that if I was a US MNC and uh, entering into an arrangement with the Indian MNC, US would want to have an uh, adjustment. Um, Michael, your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, thanks, Rajesh. I think um, from a from the captive perspective, where the where the the U.S. company is is using the Indian affiliate to register the trademark, um, typically I would want to I'd want to have some sort of uh, an agreement between the two as to who is the true owner of the trademark. Is the Indian affiliate doing it as um, just a mere nominee or something like that? Um, uh, the one the when I, when there's no agreement, I, I start to get concerned. Do we? Um, like as Rajesh says, do we have a transfer pricing issue? Do we have to? Uh, does the Indian affiliate have to charge uh, uh, some sort of a fee back to the U.S. government for that? Um, the other thing I would be concerned of when there's no agreement in place, no specific agreement between the two entities, is um, you know, do we have a deemed outbound transfer of some of the trademark rights? And that's uh, definitely a concern because again, we get we trigger U.S. tax on that if there's no specific understanding between the two affiliates um if they're separate entities um you know it's it's it comes down to more of a i think you know if it's two if it's a us mnc and an indian mnc uh, i think you get down to the question of whether there is some sort of a, there has to be again some sort of royalty pay between the two what that royalty is and how much and, and whether there's going to be withholding tax uh uh, particularly withholding tax coming out of India to the U.S. government and how much that would be. Uh, I believe, I don't know, Rajesh, I don't remember off the top of my head, Rajesh, you, you probably do. I believe India does charge a, royal, uh, a withholding tax on royalties, so. That's right. That's right. We do end up with a 10% tax on that. So I think with that, I'm going to quickly move on to my next structure. This is actually a very relevant structure in today's times because this is a collaboration structure. Now, as we all know, given the situation of pandemic, many uh, many pharma pharmaceutical companies are coming together for R and D purposes. They're joining hands, and uh, even um, some research foundations, universities, as well as pharma companies are also joining hands. So we see collaborations across the board, not only in the pharma industry. We also see collaborations across industries. Uh, we are all heavily dependent on uh, OTT platforms like Netflix and all for content. And we do see that you know there are collaborations being structured even in the media industry. Productions are coming together. Productions are coming together with platforms to basically develop some high quality content. So that's really my next question to all of you, and my next structure for all of you: collaborations. Gauri, under Indian law, uh, you know there are some IP legislations which do expressly recognize collaborations, and that there is a concept of joint ownership. How does that play out from a ownership uh, and uh, exploitation perspective and then uh, Rajesh and Michael if you could please uh, you know uh, step in with your comments uh, on the tax side sure so I think uh, since you mentioned two industries let me stick to those I can go on so I think when it comes to pharma what we have typically seen is uh, you know multiple companies may come together and fund their part of the research right in the sense that there are no monies necessarily flowing in but it is a collaboration to do that r d with their own funds however because there there is interdependency there could be you know cross licensing etc from a, at the point that michael mentioned and these are you know typically unrelated parties right uh, the, what will happen is you will have documentation flowing between the parties to say that you know because i'm doing jointly there is some license what we call as cross licensing right for co collaborative development and then typically what you can also find on the ownership front they could be a territorial division for example there could be joint ownership worldwide that is one model that either party can go out market so it's a you know it's a joint ownership without dependence on the other when i say dependence on the other that whatever i monetize i keep the keep the uh, keep the you know the kitty in some cases there could be that whoever monetizes this is the manner in which we will share profits or you know or, or the revenue 
right so there could be some of these complex structures that will come up and then the question also sometimes arises is whether i can do a territorial split as i said before where i will you know keep the ip within india complete ownership and the ip there is outside india is with the relevant party in their respect and there is absolutely no money flowing it to each other in that context it is just the that each one will continue to own right so do see these complex you know what we call as in licensing out licensing structures and thereafter the split between the ip so that is first you know in the media industry where we see a uh, uh, profit share or a revenue share we don't like to call it profit share for reason but uh, you know uh, basically revenue share uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know competition uh, front so also we have begun for example territory rights foreign territory rights then you have digital rights then who controls the global digital rights right then again parties have that split uh, where each one has their funds for right i think there is some uh, is some bandwidth uh, issue gauri at your end so uh, on the part I think Rajesh is familiar. Yeah, I think I'm going to pass it on to Rajesh to, to take it from here. Uh, Rajesh. Sure. So I think it's very interesting, right? When we can, and this is probably on level of complexities, one of the more complex issues when you think about it from a pure tax standpoint. i think the first issue and something which we are usually careful about on all of these joint development agreements is that the arrangement itself does not qualify as what we call a unincorporated joint venture or a association of persons because under our income tax act uh, one of the categories of uh, who is regarded as a person for or an assc is a association of persons which is effectively two persons coming together uh, with a view to uh, Uh, to with a view to uh, undertake certain activities and generate profit so that's pretty much the basic concept of what is a aop so in a situation where you have you know a joint development arrangements or people contributing um, uh, time materials etc to the arrangement one of the issues that we need to be careful about is that whether that would be seen as a uh, unincorporated joint venture uh, there are a lot of tests that you sort of go through to 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 try and ensure that it does not get categorized as a aop because the challenge with aop is that it's a separate taxable unit uh, so you're going to tax the unit separately as compared to each one getting taxed on their own uh, income uh, and the other and issue is high tax rate right it's a very high tax it's a high, higher tax rate because you have non residents also uh, involved you're right on that and uh, the other issue is that uh, today when we are talking about a aop the moment i go towards a profit share arrangement the likely possibility of characterization of a aop generally increases uh, what you have to show is that each one is responsible for doing their own activities and so that there is no intermingling as to one being responsible for everything or, or the other person's activities also uh, and what you also uh, a revenue share arrangement on the other hand usually satisfies the test of it not being categorized as a eop i think that is one one part of it the other issue which i will also talk about is that when you have different people trying to pool in um, uh, uh, pool in their own different resources and everyone gets to benefit from it uh, i think one of the principles uh, probably not many people would know about it is the doctrine of mutuality uh which is there you find it usually in the concept of uh, clubs and membership sort of arrangements where you have the doctrine of mutuality where everyone sort of benefits from the uh from the pool everyone contributes and everyone benefits uh so need to see what what kind of arrangement is there to see whether that doctrine also comes into place uh because that will have a, its own separate uh, tax implications i think when it comes to monetization i think the important element i would always look at is that in the different models which gauri was talking about one is that when each one has the right to market in a particular territory or sell goods in a particular territory 
that's fine that's a that's a simple model but situations where you say that yes i will a part of the revenue which i earn from a market i will share with you right you also have to see apart from the aop is this actually a payment for a license or is there a cross license what is the actual payment for that also becomes a uh, important element and the third aspect which i would also look at is that at the initial stage when people are trying to put in their different resources when we talk about cross licenses what is the nature of that and whether withholding tax implications can come in on that i think those are broadly what i would call the different issues which i would sort of pick up uh, again a lot of this goes into how you actually draft the contract and how you actually have the arrangement but these are all sort of uh, important items which i usually look for in any of these uh, arrangements and i think i just need to add thought point here is that you know a lot of times parties don't realize that there could be aop issues when they are drafting these are concepts which are simply overlooked and at a later point in time this could result in significant tax exposure so drafting the contracts properly taking into account tax consideration is a very is basically a must do right from the time you you know sign off on your term sheet so with that michael i would like to invite your thoughts on this particular structure uh, if you could please uh, share some perspective from a from a us law perspective sure Thank you, Rishi. Thank you, uh, Gary and uh, uh, Rajesh. Um, a couple things on this. One is uh, we have a similar concept to the AOP in the US. Um, when you have a joint development arrangement, it would trigger what we would, might call a partnership in the US. Um, so it's, a, it's an entity that is a separate quote unquote taxable entity, but it reports, um, it, it reports its own income, but the partners pay the tax on the income themselves. Um, there's a couple of reasons that would be relevant for this uh, um, from this perspective. One is um, is that it is depending on where the activities of each of the, the partners, the developer, the people, the participants in the joint development arrangement are located, it can give rise to uh, uh, what's called a permanent, you know, a permanent establishment for those folks in the um, in, in the in the relevant territories. Um, and that would be pr from a U.S. perspective that can change how we might view, for instance, say it, it could uh, a foreign company might be might be uh, might needs to be careful about doing a, an event arrangement like this with a U.S. company, because then potentially they have a permanent establishment in the U.S. based on the activities of the U.S. company in the U.S. on behalf of the partnership. So that agreement has to be very clear as to who's doing what, where and how um, the. The second is uh, thought I had on this is that just because it's a revenue share arrangement doesn't necessarily mean it wouldn't be a partnership for U.S. tax purposes. We definitely would want to look at that very carefully and be very careful about how um, all the parties are going to report this. The third issue that comes up that I think of when I when one of the parties to this um, uh, partnership is uh, to this the joint development arrangement if it's treated as a partnership from a u.s tax perspective is a uh um it, it, it when one of those one of the part one of the developers joint the the parties to the joint development arrangement is a u.s per person is we now have this concept of downward attribution so it can have um certain the foreign affiliate the foreign entity that's part of the joint development arrangements foreign affiliates might have um, certain um, reporting requirements or information requirements in the U.S. based on being those and uh, other affiliates of the foreign joint developer being attributed to the uh, joint development arrangement that would be treated as a partnership. So there's a, the long and short of it is a lot of issues that can come up in a situ in, in a situation like this. I think as Rajesh uh, pointed out, you have to be very careful about how you um, draft the the agreement and what the rights and and obligations of all the parties are um you know michael ask you a question you mentioned there could be some reporting requirements what kind of requirements could they be and are they very onerous uh, in nature uh, are they very tedious in nature because i believe some of our some of our audience do have questions on practicality yeah i mean it, it, generally speaking the irs has taken steps to help eliminate some of these reporting requirements but what it what it ends up doing what these re these reporting requirements wouldn't necessarily be onerous in, in the ordinary course if you were a US company 
and you had these reporting requirements for foreign affiliates, but for foreign companies, they get sometimes concerned when they start reporting acti their activities of uh, the, their foreign com companies to the US government. So it just you just need to be careful about what is going on in these, these joint development arrangements. Another situation might be as if the actual development arrangement was done as a business entity, as some sort of a partnership entity um, or corporation, and you know, separate entity that everybody's going to come in uh, as an owner of, and it's it itself is then going to have some foreign affiliates. Well, depending on what the ownership structure is, that could trigger these intern these U.S. reporting requirements, and. Again, they can be onerous requirements. It's just something that pe that all all the clients on the phone want to be careful of is how do these downward attribution rules these these rules that would attribute for uh, otherwise unconnected uh, foreign entities otherwise unconnected with the U.S. to U.S. reporting requirements. Um, Understood. That, there, that, 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 there were a couple. No, no, yeah. There were a couple quick questions that some uh, folks had. Um, about some of the previous slides. One of them was about uh, the tax re recognition rules in the U.S. Are they fixed or relative? You know, the rel how, how and when income is recognized in the U.S., it depends on a whole series of rules. And the rules are fairly standard, but they do change depending on the circumstances. So it's really a hard question to answer. You'd have to look at the facts and circumstances. And then I think Mr. Desai had a question about um, software companies that were uh, tax exempt in software technology park. He's right. If you check the box on that entity and flow the, that income up into the U.S., it will be taxed currently. Um, and then when there is um, in the U.S., and then there might not be an associated credit with it. There might be a credit in a later year. You'd have to analyze the situation for the U.S. entity to see whether there would be the credit could be taken in the earlier year. Or what it, whether it could be taken in the later year, those types of things are definitely an issue. And then we had one last question, which was the nature of income if the IP transferred is acquired on account of an amalgamation. Um, that's akin to a U.S. Uh, uh, merger. Um, typically, what would happen is there would a merger or some sort of amalgamation could trigger a U.S. tax, um, depending on the situation. You have to look at it, but that that is definitely an issue that could come up. Great, understood. That, that's very clear. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, we have time to bring in one more structure, so I'm going to go with the franchising structure. And uh, since Mr. Desai himself is uh, with us on this webinar right now, uh, his passion for tax and technology and IP is unmatched. So I'm going to ask him to do some concluding remarks at, uh, after we finish, uh, you know, this, this the next structure. So my next structure is basically a classic franchising model. As we all know, in a franchising model, there's typically a holding company, which basically houses all your intellectual property, could be brand, could be know-how, for example, you know, could be trade secrets. There's also a lot of copyrighted uh, content, which is uh, housed in this global uh, holding company. The holding company appoints a master franchisee, typically in a jurisdiction such as India, and the master franchisee could then appoint sub franchisees. Now, Gauri, many, many questions on uh, from an IP perspective, uh, you know, come come to my mind here because there is not one, but a, a but, but many different types of intellectual property that are getting licensed under a franchise arrangement. Should we do one franchise arrangement? Should we have, uh, uh, you know, where, where all IP is licensed? We have different types of uh, licensing arrangements. How do you look at it uh, from, 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 from an IP perspective? Sure. So I think uh, I will also add one more variation that we have begun to see in a bit uh, in, in some, you know, like fintech sector or otherwise. But, <clears throat> but in a classic franchise model, first of all, am I audible now? Yes, please go ahead. So in a classic franchise model in the Indian context, you will rarely find that a foreign entity is setting up its own sub as a sub uh, franchisee. The reason being, uh, that the uh, you know they are they want an Indian partner who is who has a wherewithal to you know manage the business within India, right? So you need a strong Indian partner and <clears throat> <coughs> sorry that is your three C sets speaking. 
okay <laughs> so when you have uh, you know the indian uh, entity which is a completely unrelated party but i think i'm going to ask you know also point out one particular proposition which uh, you know uh, uh, though it is an unrelated is it really an unrelated i'll, I'll uh, you know come to that in a bit but this particular entity essentially will sort of get a trademark license we'll get a uh, you know a know how license as you said and also when i say know how it is not just handing over of papers but there will be training so you will have a train to train the trainer kind of a situation where we have seen you know in complex franchises where you know the employees of the the master franchisee actually go and take training so that they are able to train the sub franchisees employees right so you have that uh, and the reason i'm you know making these differentiations because i know there will be different tax impact for each right so you have a simplicity trademark license which is which is clear then you have this enabling services that you will see and then the there will be passive kind of so, you know copyrighted material to say okay you know this, this is the insignia and and the like and one more element sometimes we have seen is a procurement deal meaning that they will say that you will buy some of the some of the uh, you know uh, some, some of the articles that you need to portray in the franchise uh, you know outlets and all of that only from me right so which is the foreign party so there will be that supply relationship as well uh, in in the same you know same contract so uh, so this is this is something uh, you know which is uh, you know from a from a documentation perspective for me it doesn't matter whether it is a single document or multiple documents the only reason it will matter is you know how do i you know craft reps and warranties indemnities how do i enforce a consolidated contract because i am able to see a sometimes the consolidated breach because sometimes you know each breach separately gets difficult to demonstrate but a consolidated breach is you know sometimes sort of out there to demonstrate right so i will be more uh, you know happy to have a single contract now coming to a slight variation that we have seen um, is now a lot of digital platforms so we have in the recent past done a, a lot of work where you have a single platform right i would sort of it just visualize as a digital franchise right so basically you have a platform which the indian entity gets uh, you know right to use that platform when i say platform it's a technology platform and the right to use that platform so there is no software license but as we call a saas you know it's a software as a service or a platform as a service and then also right to use the trademark along with that correct so that you are able to you know use the indian company which is again a unrelated party is able to access that platform use the brand and offer the services in india right uh, to the on a b2c level for example if you, like like we have done some of these things in the gaming industry right so then in my mind it is akin to a franchise model but on the digital platform uh, i hope i'm clear uh, you know because here you are talking in a franchise traditional is brick and mortar and here you have a you know sort of mirroring of that in the digital space so uh, we are beginning to see these type of deals quite often and then the question arises what is the fee whether it should be a composite fee whether it should be separate fee for each type of ip are you able to distinguish that or not you know that separate and if there are breaches or you know there are certain uh, uh, you know uh, sort of uh, uh, you know uh, 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 you know uh, set offs etc whether it is possible to do so among you know like for example certain cases you have uh, you know revenue based payouts so are these revenue based payouts for the trademark or are these revenue based payouts for the use of technology right so that question will also arise so these models will have to be you know quickly looked into in like in further details then to look at you know and and the point that michael made is absolutely valid because that is what we at nda constantly do is ip team and tax team sit together to figure out you know what is the best way of articulating the structure which is the right structure because sometimes i have seen in specially these complex contracts you go overboard to protect the ip when you go overboard you tend to have clauses which really have you know no meaning uh, you know in in a relevant relationship but it demonstrates to the tax uh, you know officer some other flavor to the relationship you know wanting to use that clause in a different perspective right so and that is something we have seen quite often in these complex relationships
And Gauri, you drive home a very important point. We do have to adapt our brick and mortar models for an online kind of a scenario. And we are living in a different world now with social distancing norm and, and the way the world is going crazy. We do have to quickly, uh, you know, remodel so that uh, the, the models that we are used to in, in, the, in the old model, or in the old normal, are now adept to the new normal. Uh, before I move on to Rajesh, in this case, uh, Michael, I would like to come to you first. You know, in India, at least as far as franchising is concerned, we don't have any sort of a codified law. It is basically a fragment of contractual documentation. We do heavily rely on the negotiated rights and obligations of the parties. How does uh, US, and I, I'm aware, but you know, for, for the benefit of our users, how does US look at franchising before you, you know, step into uh, the tax piece? Uh, thank you, Arushi. So uh, franchising is a matter of state law. Uh, it goes state by state, um, but e almost every state, I think every state has a, just about every state has a, has a franchise statute. Um, it, it's kind of like a securities offering when you, if you're a franchise order and you're going to offer to franchises to, to, uh, to potential franchisees, you have to go with the state. Typically, you have to register the franchise. Uh, there are criminal penalties if you don't register the franchise oftentimes. Um, so you have to file a, what's called a franchise disclosure document and some standard documents with the state, uh, the state government. Um, they then take that information and, um, and and then it becomes public record. And then that's a, a, a disclosure that that you have to provide to your franchisees. And then you do have the whole raft of, of franchise documents. From a tax perspective, I would say, particularly in a cross-border scenario, one of the important things to understand is um, the, the, these franchise fees are typically in the nature of royalties. So you might see some other types of payments, at least to help avoid some of the, um, the the um, withholding taxes on royal that often apply on royalties. So you might have uh, a, a procurement side of the contract where they're selling product or supplies, and there might also be a services part. So instead of it being, um, for instance, franchise fees, it might be paid for marketing fees. Um, so those are some of the things that I think about with franchises. Other than as long as they're third party relationships, there aren't a lot of other tax issues that come up. At, other than the cross border withholding taxes. And then obviously, I don't know if India has a VAT. I think they do, um, but um, a value added tax or some sort of consumption tax. But that's always a shock for middle market US businesses is when they learn of the the, the consumption taxes in other countries. So um, I'll turn it over to Rajesh now. Thanks for bringing the VAT part because I was itching to ask you about GST, uh, Rajesh. So this is a good chance to speak about it. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll add a couple of different aspects to what Michael said, right? Apart from obviously the fact that you do worry about uh, uh, what are the different streams of revenue that you can generate from a franchise arrangement, because some may be subject to a withholding taxes royalty, some may not necessarily because they may be qualify as uh, business income. Uh, and not come within the purview of uh, fees for technical services, but I. So, but apart from that, there is one other aspect that I also think about is uh, the issue of permanent establishment, uh, especially when you have people coming in for uh, training, when you have people who are coming in to, uh, to, to oversee, because sometimes you send people along with, uh, with the franchise arrangement. You also say that, yes, I will send two or three experts to, to India uh, who will sort of help you along with it. So I do worry about uh, uh, any kind of permanent related, uh, permanent establishment related issues. Uh, which can uh, come up uh, even as part of uh, um, the, these arrangements. Uh, in respect of GST, I'm less fussed about because those are all ultimately creditable in most cases. So I worry about that a little bit less in these kind of arrangements, especially because of the way that supply chain moves uh, in this particular instance. But uh, I think uh, uh, apart from that, again, the question does come in that uh, uh, under certain circumstances, even though they may not be a uh, uh, a relationship by way of shareholding, can they still be transfer pricing uh, that can come in? Because the Indian party is uh, absolutely dependent on the foreign party. We do have some cases which have said that uh, that no shareholding is 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 a prerequisite, along with the other criteria for transfer pricing to apply. But again, that I think that that law is still evolving. I think those are really the points I would think of uh, from from a franchise arrangement. Um, uh, 
the last thing I will add, because Tori did go on into uh, the issue around digital platforms a little bit. Uh, so, and where the platform itself is actually licensed to the Indian party. Uh, we do need to think about equalization levy because we have an expanded scope for uh, e-com uh, services. Though in a situation where the license is actually given a, or the platform is given as a license to an Indian party, to my mind, that comes out of the purview of equalization levy. But depending on the kind of model, we just need to be careful around. Right, right. Anything else on deferred consideration, especially in a franchise uh, model, you sometimes do negotiate deferred consideration or you know tranche payouts which go on for a very long time so any specific thoughts around that that's fine that's fine because unlike in case of capital gains where the income recognition happens uh, up front in a in a uh, franchise sort of situation i worry less about deferred consideration uh, i can actually do the recognition at a later point in time depending on how i structure that that, that that's absolutely <laughs> I think we are already, uh, you know, uh, uh, 10 minutes up, but, um, and I, I uh, Michael has already responded to some of the questions. Some I responded in the chat window. If, uh, uh, if, uh, uh, Nishita, if you're around, uh, I can't see you on screen right now, but if you would like to come in the session and speak a few words, uh, uh, now is a good time. Yeah, okay, I'm here. Very much so I'm learning. And uh, wonderful session. Thank you so much, first of all, Michael for coming uh, to this panel at a short notice. And uh, Gauri, this is a hat trick. So you had three sessions done today. And um, Rajesh, of course, as usual, cross-border, uh, you know, taxation, uh, you handle very well. And Arushi, thank you for moderating. I would just like to make one or two comments here at this point in time, that today to think of an international tax lawyer without understanding of an IP, I think is somewhat inconceivable. 60 to 80, sometimes 89% of the problems in international tax all are linked to IP. If you take cross-border mergers and acquisitions, the largest valuations or the largest mergers and acquisitions, the strategic objective of acquisitions today are acquiring IP. At one point of time, they are physical properties, but today it is all about IP. If you take transfer pricing, Transfer price of intangibles is the trickiest area. Royalties, fees for technical services, platform usage, all this IP gets so much involved in every business model that you develop, you know, and therefore understanding IP is very important. And it's not just about patent or copyright, but confidential information, the secret processes and the designs and, you know, and also the market intangibles and number of theories that get built up around the uh, IP, you know, is very, very important to understand for everybody, you know, who, are, who is a professional. And to manage IP is also very, very managing IP portfolio along with tax is also very important. Third thing I would say that, you know, many a times people come and tell us, I want to flip a company, which you discussed in the beginning a bit. And okay, where do you flip? You flip it to the US, which is the normal, because that's where the first mind goes that in Silicon Valley, you get valuation. But as Michael mentioned, that once you flip, you know, then to reflip elsewhere is going to be very tricky. So do you need intermediate companies to put, and then you have a company in the US? How do you go about it? Which are the jurisdictions? There are all the jurisdictions today are providing, or at least trying to provide uh, significant tax breaks, okay? And um, whether you take, you know, um, UK, Netherlands, France, Everyone is providing tax breaks for now. If you go for the tax break purposes, uh, whether GAR is applicable or not, what happens to the whole thing? So today, the whole structuring has become very, very tricky, and everything is happening on the cloud. So as I've been mentioning throughout the tax series, that you know how are you going to handle this? Even tax administrators can't do it very easily because they do not know. Where is the location of IP? Where the IP was generated? Who contributed where? You know, so you know all those kind of things. Uh, really speaking, I think we have to find new way of doing things. Today we are trying to find uh, solutions to new age problems using the old age tools. And some somewhere on the line we'll have to you know uh, solve it. And uh, of course I talk about one world one tax all the time. 
uh, but I think uh, till such time our message goes, you have to keep on repeating, you know. And uh, but I think it's been very important to integrate IP and tax in every transaction, particularly this days is very very critical. So strategy, IP, tax, all those kind of things have come together, and we have all to work together to you know find some interesting solutions. And uh, one thing we I always believe is there is always a problem solution to a problem but some people only find problems to solutions i think that's not the way to go about and um, if, if things get too complicated you also have to really wonder whether you really want to complicate your life and better to pay off tax than not do any planning and i think live simple life but there's a philosophical uh, conclusion uh, ultimately purpose of all that we do is to be happy and enjoy life but you know we have to be making sure that nobody else bounces on your happiness just because you're so simple done or simplicity you know so simple structures also have their own problems but uh, i think these are the, the, the you have to take a lot more philosophical approach to tax planning as well so one has to be extremely careful it's a very very fine surgery that you have to do and uh, you know uh, tax rates in most countries are down but at the same time a non availability of tax credits and artificial allowances, fictional income, all that add up, not only to the tax and tax rates, but also the management time and attention that goes into all these unproductive activities, you know, is also something somebody needs to put value to that and see uh, to what extent all this thing is worth it. But with those words, I would uh, close this session and uh, uh, we'll discuss more at, uh, other sessions that are going to come up. Thank you so much for a wonderful session. Appreciate it. And all the audience, the world, thank you.